Um, dear ministers, dear delegates, good day to all of you. Buenos dias a todos. Welcome to this side event of the Mondia Cal 2022 conference organized by the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign and the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. My name is Ivan Otashevich. I'm an assistant director of the UNESCO Chair on the Diversity of Cultural Expressions at Laval University, and I will have the pleasure to moderate our discussions today. Entitled From Policy to Practice, the role of culture in the 2030 agenda and beyond, this event aims to highlight and promote the fundamental role that cultural sector and culture play in the achievement of all the sustainable development goals of the 2030 agenda. Furthermore, it aims to support the recognition of a culture as a sustainable development goal in its own right beyond 2030. Mondia Cult 2022 represents an important opportunity to advance these objectives, especially as UNESCO threatens and intensifies policy dialogue at the global level in the field of culture. To achieve this, it is necessary for all the governments to integrate culture into, a, into their development policies in all levels and in all sectors, as it is stipulated by Article 13 of the 2005 UNESCO Convention on the protection and promotion of the diversity of cultural expressions. In order to contribute to a better understanding of the links and interconnections between policy and practice, this event wishes to present two outcomes. On the policy side, a zero draft of a future culture goal prepared by the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign will be presented by John Crawley, an independent consultant, in a few, in a few moments. Afterwards, and at a more practical level, a new culture for SDGs toolkit that acts as a practical guide to the UN's SDGs for cultural and heritage organizations in Canada will be presented by Barbara Filion from the Canadian Commission for UNESCO and Paolo Granata, an associate professor in book and media studies at the University of Toronto. These two outcomes will serve as a springboard for a discussion about what objectives cultural policies should include, how to articulate these in the context of a broader development agenda, and how such policies will support cultural actors in the practical level. During this 30-minute discussion period, I would like to invite our respondents who are in front of me to participate in the exchange period. Our respondents are Jordi Pasqual, coordinator from the United Cities and Local Governments Culture Committee, Zilia Fischer, Secretary General from International Music Council, Tere Badia, Secretary General from Culture Action Europe, Gabe Gaballero, SDGs Coordinator from International Council on Monuments and Sites, Claire Maguire, Policy and Advocacy Officer from International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, Marie-Julie Desrochers, Secretary General from International Federation of Coalitions for Cultural Diversity, and the last but not least, Amelia Mathieu, Vice President of Arterial Network. Thank you very much for your presence today. After our discussion period, I would have the pleasure to invite Alexandra Xantaki, the United Nations Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights, who will uh, tell some final words. Without further delay, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Crowley, who will introduce the zero draft of a future culture goal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you turn it off? Thank you very much. Can you hear me adequately? So my task um, is to give you a 10-minute overview of a very recently published report entitled The Culture Goal is Essential for Our Common Future. I won't check who's read it because it has very recently been released. But if I succeed in 10 minutes in giving you an interest in reading it, then that's already a very important first result. If you need uh, help in finding it, 
I'll give you the URL later. What I want to do is try to explain why this report was produced, how it was produced, what it contains, and what we think should be done with it. If I can cover each of those points in about two minutes, then I fit within my time frame and I give you a taster uh, of what you should run away to read immediately. Everyone agrees at some level, and we have quotations in the report to that effect, that culture is extremely important for development, sustainable development, the future of societies. Probably everyone who was involved in adopting the sustainable development goals as enacted by the UN General Assembly in September 2015 would have agreed in principle with the statement that yes, culture is very important. But I'm sure you read the sustainable development goals at least once a week and the targets at least once a month. And you will have noticed that of the 17 goals, none is specifically about culture. And of the 169 targets, culture is mentioned in six, seven, or eight, depending exactly on how you count, and never in a, a specific, focused, genuinely culture-centered way. What this means is not just that specific cultural concerns are missing from the current SDG framework. It is furthermore that the transversal connections between culture and everything else are missing as well. In her address to the opening ceremony this morning, um, the UNESCO Director General mentioned, for instance, climate change and biodiversity as areas that culture needs to contribute to. That's two of the 17 sustainable development goals that are inadequately anchored in a cultural perspective. But that will be equally true of eradicating extreme poverty. That's a cultural challenge. Achieving gender equality. That's a cultural challenge. Making cities livable. That's a cultural challenge. So when we say that culture is missing, it's not simply that there isn't something for the cultural sector. It's that those crucial connections between culture and everything else, while widely recognized at some level as being relevant, are actually completely missing from the framework. That is a defect, a foundational defect. The reason for writing the report was to try to understand how that came about, so there's some historical analysis, and how it could be changed. What the report contains is a template for what could become a culture goal that takes both of the boxes that I just referred to, recognizing the specific concerns of the culture sector in the broad sense, and at the same time, um, ensuring the lateral connections between culture and the other sustainable development goals, all of which can benefit from a cultural lens, many of which absolutely require strong lateral connections with cultural concerns if they are to be achieved. And the point is to achieve them. They are aspirational, of course, but they're the aspirations to which the international community committed itself in 2015. So how did we do it? We did it, as always, with a lot of consultation. Many stakeholders were involved, giving views about what the key issues were, are. Um, those views were not always necessarily the same. So there was the usual process of agreeing on an outcome. The outcome as agreed on is very consensual, but that consensus as always was built. It didn't just emerge spontaneously because this is a campaign, a campaign working together towards a common objective. And building a shared view among the people campaigning is crucial to the success of the campaign. A survey was also conducted 168 people answered an online survey with a range of questions, some closed, some open, on how the SDGs were relevant to their work, whether the lack of a culture-specific SDG was hampering the achievement of their professional objectives, and to what extent they would support uh, a culture-specific goal. And while not unanimous, the support was very, very large, depending on the precise questions, 80 to 95% of the respondents, primarily, of course, cultural professionals, expressed the view that the absence of a culture goal did make a practical difference on the ground. This isn't just window dressing or some nice to have thing that would flatter the egos of people who go to international meetings. It does, according to the professionals themselves, make a difference on the ground to cultural practices, cultural institutions, cultural activities. 
With that in mind, building on the results of the survey, building on the analysis of why previous attempts to promote a culture goal haven't been fully successful, we uh, developed in the report an indicative framework for drafting a culture goal, which is actually a draft, a full draft, a working draft, a zero draft, as someone referred to it earlier, of a goal and 10 targets, eight specific, two transversal. Those of you familiar with the SDG framework will have noted that some targets are numbered with Arabic numerals, and some targets have letters. Letters indicate the targets that are completely transversal and relate to the connection between that goal and other goals. And if we're talking about a goal 18, as a number of people mentioned in the event just before this one, then goal 16, which is quite close in the listing, is a good example. Goal 16, if you, for those of you familiar with the framework, is about peace, justice, and inclusion. It has a number of numbered targets, plus two with letters. And the two with letters predict and very correctly make the connection between peace, justice, and inclusion because poverty and gender equality and sustainable production and consumption and all the other things about peace and inclusion. We thought that that model of how to draft was very relevant to the two objectives of a culture goal, to respond to specific concerns of a certain area of activity, and at the same time to recognize the density and richness of lateral connections. The um, initial framing wording of the culture goal is very simple because we know that people will want to add things. So starting simple gives some space for discussion because obviously this needs to be taken up and run with by you who will read the report, by the participants in this conference who need to take note of the concern, which I don't think anyone can seriously agree with, that leaving our culture in 2015 was a mistake and the mistakes are there to be fixed, not necessarily in 2030. Why wait if it's urgent? Well, that's a different discussion. I'll come to that in a moment. The wording is, ensure cultural sustainability for the well-being of all. That's only, mumble, 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 eight words. Those eight words are then filled in, because of course each of those words is very loaded, uh, by the possible targets. I won't read them in full because I don't have time, but I'll run through them very quickly so you have a flavor of how the targets have been structured. Target one is about the realization of cultural rights. And it, we, it was placed as target one, um, even though the targets aren't meant to be ordered by priority in the SDG framework, still recognizing at least the rhetorical and conceptual priority of cultural rights which as the special rapporteur have, has said several times correctly, are not just aspirations, they're legal obligations. So in an aspirational framework, they need to be given a special status. Secondly, promote a culture of peace and nonviolence. Third, protect and safeguard all forms of heritage, recognizing the conventions that exist for that purpose and making the same kind of connection between the existing culture conventions and SDG 18, maybe we can start calling it like that for campaigning purposes, as exists between SDG 13 on climate action and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. If you read the text, you will see that it is explicitly stated that the UNFCCC is the primary location for discussion about climate action under the SDGs, but it's still an SDG. In the same way, the culture conventions can be the primary location for uh, intergovernmental discussion and action, but it's still an SDG, not something separate from it. Fourth, protect and promote the diversity of cultural expressions, something that also connects to an existing conventional framework. Fifth, in devising and implementing policies on cultural and creative industries, promote local culture and products. There are more words in the target, I'm not reading the whole thing, but the point being that Promoting the sustainability of certain areas of activity of which tourism is exemplary should not come at the cost of the erosion of cultural rights, integrity of cultural practices, fair access to cultural opportunities for uh, the populations affected by tourism, particularly mass tourism. Sixth, enhance legal conditions 
and practical opportunities for mobility of cultural pro uh, professionals and cross-border creativity. I doubt that in a room such as this, particularly a crowded room, the topic has attracted interest, anyone is insensitive to the problems of mobility that prevent many artists and other cultural professionals from crossing borders to uh, do their job. And also, hence cross-border creativity, prevents the potential audiences from having direct access to those artists and performers. It goes both ways. Mobility is a win-win, and the mechanism should be created to ensure that it operates on a win-win basis. Seven, empower indigenous peoples to strengthen their own institutions, cultures, and languages. There is a separate framework for indigenous peoples within the UN. But again, the point is to recognize the connection, not to take over the terrain of another framework, but to articulate it in a sensitive and sensible way so as to achieve its objectives and at the same time, the objectives of the SDGs. Eight, develop a cultural approach in environmental protection and sustainable urbanization, which goes to the heart of what Audrey Azoulay was saying this morning in her remarks in the fourth of her objectives for Mondia Cult as emerging from the consultation process with member states that issues to do with climate and biodiversity must be considered through a cultural lens if action is, is to be successful. And that, of course, trickles down all the way to issues of landscape management, for instance, or urban regeneration. And then eight numbered targets, two, two others, A and B, which recognize the transversal connections. A uh, states strengthen cultural institutions to build capacity at all levels to realize all of this, recognizing that the strengthening of cultural institutions isn't just something that fits within one particular goal, but is part of the effort of societies as a whole to achieve the SDG framework as a whole. And of course, strengthening cultural institutions includes the very important issues of quality of employment within the cultural sector and funding of cultural institutions. And finally, and then I will close uh, more or less within time, ensure through transversal multi-stakeholder collaboration that cultural considerations are taken into account in all international development goals as things evolve, including in future transformations of the SDGs or any instruments uh, developed under the framework to respond to specific issues. To say that culture is everywhere risks diluting culture. The challenge is to flip that round the other way and to say that precisely because culture is everywhere, which it is, it needs to be recognized and strongly embedded in all the frameworks to respond to issues, even those that don't look obviously cultural. And I will close with a slogan, which I came up with yesterday in another event, and people seem to like it. But take any part of the SDGs and ask yourself, try to do it without culture, and you will realize you are condemned to fail. That's what we need to respond to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Crowley, for your very enlightening presentation. It gave us a better understanding of this new approach, ensuring that culture is placed at the heart of development actions, actions and uh, policies. Thank you. So now I would like to invite Barbara Filion and Paolo Granata to say a few words about the Culture for SDGs uh, Goals Toolkit. Thank you. We have a few slides, uh, so I'll uh, ask the uh, Phoenicians to put it on. And so here we are, the Culture for SDGs Toolkit. My name is Paolo Granata. I'm Barbara Filion. And um, we are very pleased. So hot of press, uh, our um, uh, SDGs uh, Culture uh, uh, Toolkit. And so how everything started. So we wanted to share with you how we came up with this very practical way to bridge the gap, to go find uh, culture in the SDGs. That was a challenge. And so everything started a couple of years ago at the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. Uh, we gathered as a round table to reflect on the value of culture for sustainable development. There was a very important community building exercise. And I think uh, this is the real value of uh, UNESCO on a local uh, level, bringing people together 
and make things uh, happen, make things happen in a very practical way. And so after that round table, we realized that uh, to move on, to explore the potential of culture in uh, sustainable development, uh, we needed a practical uh, tool and a practical working group for moving on. And so I'll uh, give the room to my colleague, Barbara. So um, my predecessor who's here today Catherine Turvey actually put together an amazing working group of experts in the cultural heritage, arts, and academic, uh, academic spheres, and also included some youth voices from our youth advisory group. And so she put together this amazing working group that was led by, by Paolo. And we started the work during the pandemic, which means that we met online. And so we spent a lot of time uh, brainstorming, discussing, um, what what this toolkit was going to be about and and figuring out the content and after two years of meeting online um, we we were able to complete the toolkit that's so what the toolkit is for so in uh, one word we wanted to ensure that Canada's culture uh, sector is on the front lines and plays a full role in helping the world to realize the 2030 agenda there was, was our challenge to go find culture in the 17 goals, so 169 targets, reading most every week, <laughs> that all the targets, to really go find so nice. wherever there is culture in there. And so I'll give you later a few examples. But eventually we had the three main um, uh, goals for this toolkit. So providing a roadmap, a practical example, practical ways, practical steps to move on for cultural organization and institutions in Canada to really have a practical agenda on how to align SDGs to their cultural operations. Then the second goal is to raise awareness and so to mobilize uh, uh, our uh, collective sector and so making sure that those who were already doing well, they could raise awareness in their communities and, uh, and local uh, sections. And then sharing practices. This is going to be the, the next phase of our toolkit. So we aim to um, collect in practices, uh, good practices that can really inspire other cultural heritage organizations in Canada to, to do well, to, do, to really uh, align their operations to SDGs. And uh, there is something unique in this toolkit. Uh, it's intended to focus on Canada, so Canadian uh, organizations, uh, uh, cultural and heritage organizations. There is something unique. I'll go to Barbara again for it. Well, um, recognition, yeah, reconciliation is a priority for um, the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. And so we really wove um, ways in which cultural organizations can support reconciliation throughout the, the toolkit. Um, in 2019, as some of you may know, the Canadian government came out with a report assessing its progress so far on the 2030 agenda. And um, in this report, it identified five key areas of, that they want to focus on, and one of them being reconciliation and the 2030 agenda. Um, the, the report also acknowledged that um, in Canada... Um, it is not a fair and equitable society for Indigenous people, and it committed to working with Indigenous people to change this situation, mostly through the implementation of the United Nations rights on uh, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, cultural heritage uh, organizations really have a key role to play in in um, forwarding reconciliation. And the SDGs really provide a way to holistically address reconciliation, which is really akin to indigenous worldviews. Through the SDGs, you can bring together identity, languages, history, um, and the well being of individuals, communities, and the planet. And so, and, and culture is really what ties all of these elements together. When I was um, last week with an elder, a Cree elder, Elmer Ghostkeeper, I just want to take a little minute to take to share this story. He he told me that there's no word in Cree for culture, but he did share with me a word that connects to ideas around culture, and the word is minopi and it it roughly translates to the way we live and the way the land makes us live. And it really brought home to me that culture is not something that we go out to experience, but really something that, that we embody, that, that we live every day continuously. And I think that's an important point and really can inspire, um, inspire ways of thinking about what, do, what a culture of sustainability means and actually looks like. 
And so to move on on a very practical way, eventually we did the roadmap. So this is the um, our uh, plan. It's not just a recipe. It's all we wanted to provide a few possible examples on how to practical advancing, advancing SDGs in cultural and heritage organizations. So we wanted to um, provide some uh, means for starting up uh, uh, the, the, the journey, but also for uh, even improving the journey for those organizations who are already doing well and they want to better align their operations. And so uh, we have a few uh, first uh, steps, talk, look, connect. So the idea that uh, any organization should be aware of what they are doing already and so how to start up that community building exercise start talking start to looking seriously what they are doing and how to connect with society and community then the next steps are a little bit more advanced for organizing uh, teaming up boosting so the idea for instance to include SDGs in their uh, strategic uh, plans so if a strategic plan for a, a cultural organization includes SDGs as a core component that will uh, impact and affect, inform everything that the organization does. So we wanted to really address those important points always in a very practical way with possible tips, not necessarily in a sequential way, but possible tips to again to start up aligning it to SDGs. Then we did the actual uh, uh, work on aligning the SDGs, uh, the current 17 SDGs, and go finding where is culture. So eventually, we selected seven goals that are mostly uh, relevant to, to culture. We found the seeds of uh, cultural impact in those seven goals, and also uh, 18 targets, specifically targets that can be relevant to culture. And uh, eventually, we came up with a list of 42 43 practical actions, right, to uh, apply, to uh, uh, align and address, most importantly, the targets, not only the goals. And so here you see, for instance, a few examples, culture for education. So for each goal, we ask why relevant, why culture is relevant, what the culture sector can do, and uh, what are the implications. We really wanted to find in those seven goals uh, all the implications, all the uh, links uh, to the culture sector. And so uh, you see that for any goal, uh, some targets are uh, uh, identified. And so practical actions uh, are suggested to practically uh, align uh, SDGs uh, to uh, the cultural organizations uh, in, uh, in Canada, including some, uh, some resources. So we really, again, uh, the very beginning of our discussion was the, the culture, the missing pillar, the missing element in the SDGs. And so our work was intended to really find how we can make the most of the 17 goals and find in seven plus uh, um, 18 targets a, a cultural uh, meaningful aspect of those, uh, of those uh, targets. And we wanted to share one good practice. Yeah, we wanted to just showcase one organization using the SDGs in the work that they do, and that's the Aga Khan uh, Museum in Toronto. They have a project titled Education for SDGs, where they're developing resources for teachers to be able to teach the SDGs through arts and culture. Um, and when we were doing this work, we noticed that there are a lot of cultural organizations advancing the 2030 agenda, but they're not using the SDGs to and connecting with them. And that means that there's really a missed opportunity to value culture as one of the driving engines or driving forces uh, to sustainable development. And it also, um, we really wanted to develop this toolkit to engage cultural organizations so that they can you know, really be part of this shared vision of, of advancing sustainable development goals and also connecting their local initiatives to the broader national and international policies and initi initiatives. Um, we also think that if cultural organizations use the SDGs, they also can connect and have a common vocabulary and framework to then partner and advance the work that they're doing. And that's why as an extension of the toolkit, we created a community of action, which Paul is gonna tell you a little bit more about. Oh, yes, here it is. The SDGs uh, community in action. So oh, rather than just gathering uh, good practices uh, and including good practices in the toolkit, 
the toolkit will uh, spark, will encourage, uh, will foster participation and engagement uh, to really, uh, again, gather um, um, ideas, uh, good practices, and so to share those practices in order to encourage others in the culture sector to do the same. So to some extent, the community in action intends to foster a self-assessment. So culture organizations can be aware of the, what they are doing and so do a self-assessing process, start up a process of a self-assessment, but also then submit what they are doing. So share what they are doing. We will uh, review, we will uh, eventually uh, get in touch with those organizations in order to showcase the beauty of the uh, good practices, the beauty of how cultural and heritage organizations in Canada are doing to advancing SDGs uh, through culture. And so we really hope that uh, the community in action uh, uh, campaign, the culture for SDGs campaign, will mobilize uh, uh, the culture sector in Canada in order to share, in order to showcase, in order to provide a practical example on how advancing SDGs uh, through culture. The toolkit is available, you can download it, uh, culture for SDGs. Uh, CA and so uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, providing feedback. This is an ongoing project. So the toolkit is printed, but all the rest must be uh, created by our uh, community in action. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara and Paola, for your presentation. We have arrived now at our exchange period, so I will invite all of our respondents to ask their questions, comments, and observations. And if you allow me, I would like to start our discussion with one question addressed to all of our respondents. Why do we need the culture as a sustainable development goal in its own right? Hello. Why do we need the culture goal in its own right? Well, as we follow the implementation of the SDGs, we observe that their achievement is being hampered by barriers. Barriers that can be systemic, that can be behavioral. And John referred to cultural challenges. And we believe that through a cultural lens, these challenges, these barriers can actually be addressed in a very meaningful way. So a culture goal can anchor exactly this cultural lens in the development framework. We, um, John referred to the cultural approach that is needed when we talk about achieving poverty reduction, gender equality, protection of biodiversity, urban uh, landscapes, um, environmental protection. The draft final declaration for the Maniacal 22 conference already recognizes the role of culture in addressing climate change. It refers notably to local and traditional knowledge and cultures, but we also believe that creativity and arts can help address, once again, these challenges, these barriers. And uh, what our colleagues from the Canadian Culture Co the Canadian Commission for UNESCO have just uh, explained, there is a lot about the relevance of culture in the achievement uh, of each of the SDGs. So here too, we, we actually see in this relevance the cultural lens that we're talking about. And in short, um, exactly what John said, try to address each of the SDGs without including culture and you're condemned to fail. That's why we need a culture goal in its own right. Thank you. Thank you, Celia. So, uh, buenos dias, good afternoon. So yesterday we had a discussion about uh, this topic uh, altogether, and I concluded my presentation by saying that the culture cannot be marginalized as the pandemic, for example, uh, dramatically taught us. It is a public good, a basic human need. So this is how I start my statement today, because that is why the world uh, needs a specific culture goal to ensure that adequate focus on our culture at the highest level of government, be it national, regional, and 
local, or to see it more simply, to avoid its marginalization regarding the huge challenges sustainable development brings us in the coming years. Cultural diversity of expressions relies on sustainable development to thrive, but the opposite is also true. Sustainable development needs diversity of cultural expression to be achieved. At the International Federation of Coalition for Cultural Diversity, which I represent, we bring together a large number of cultural professionals from around the world, organized regionally to mirror UNESCO organizations. Among our 30 member organizations, we count, I'm sorry, we count creators, artists, independent producers, distributors, broadcasters, and publishers in the literature, film, television, music, performing arts, and visual arts sectors. Since 2007, we've played a leading role in bringing together civil society to support the implementation of the 2005 convention, not least in achieving the aim of its unique Article 11, which provides for the involvement of civil society. We see ourselves as translators and pollinizators of its inspirational articles. The IFCCD also intends to strengthen international cooperation in favor of developing countries through several means, building their capacities in the elaboration and implementation of cultural policies, technology transfer, financial support, and preferential treatment for their artists and cultural professionals. A campaign for fair remuneration of the cultural, for the cultural sector, and we are delighted to also support the Fair Trade Initiative. But moreover, part of our mission is to integrate culture into sustainable development, which of course brings me here today. In fact, Article 13 in the Convention and its operational guidelines specifically addresses culture and sustainability and urges parties to develop policies conducive conducive to these aims. This part of our mission could be considered transversal. As I said, diversity of cultural expressions can only thrive in a sustainable development context. And that means, that means for us, where strong regional cultural ecosystems strengthening the local value chain exist. Such ecosystems allow cultural content to be produced and consumed locally first, while assuring creators and producers fair remuneration and work conditions and giving citizens access to the culture that belongs to them. And that is true from the North to the South worldwide. Thank you. Can, can you hear me? Okay, thanks. Um, Ivana, thanks for the question. And uh, I would like to say magandang hapon po sa lahat. That's in my native language. Uh, I think the, you had a good question there. And my name is um, uh, Gabriel Caballero. I'm the focal point for the for ECOMOS, the International Council of Monuments and Sites on the, F, uh, on the UN SDGs. And the question of um, why do we need a culture goal? I think um, we had a discussion yesterday and there was a question on why is it important to the no local person, to anyone on the street? And I think uh, we need to, and we also had another conversation at their also our side event, the Ecomas uh, uh, Monticle 2022 uh, Culture Forum, and there was also a similar question. The the for us, I think um, uh, we many people in the culture sector and the people on the ground thinks it's too complex. There's not a lot, not not, um, not sure how to integrate it in their normal lives, and um, I think uh, the connections are not clear. But uh, for us in the culture sector, we need to, if we want to be engaged, then it's better to have an explicit goal that says, yes, mm -hmm. we're part of this uh, uh, SDGs. And uh, although for the heritage sector, there's a target 11.4, which ensures the safeguarding of the world's cultural and natural heritage. I think, uh, well, ECOMOS uh, believes that this is not enough. We need to band together as a part of uh, a larger community that uh, holds uh, culture uh, uh, as part of uh, uh, the people that is responsible for the SDGs. Uh, civil society, uh, and uh, for us, many of us in the civil society, we need to band together. We need to make this happen. And uh, I, I know that uh, we are in front of us are a lot of uh, ministers of culture. So you also have that responsibility that uh, uh, comes with the civil society to put this together in the next couple of years to really make it happen. And, um, and discuss 
how we all can be responsible for a, a sustainable development and integrate that to our work. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Claire McGuire from the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. I'll keep my remarks very brief, but thank you for this really important question. I think another reason to touch on is that culture has the power to help us achieve across the development agenda. Culture is an accelerator of development, and we need um, we need a cultural goal to help um, strengthen the, our advocacy and strengthen those connections. And in, we just finished a side event on culture and education linkages and working with um, cultural institutions like libraries, museums, um, schools, cultural centers to help um, enable culture to impact on education rights. This, um, this zero draft has a strong rights-based based approach. We have a right to education, we have a right to information, we also have a right to culture, and all of those things are intertwined. So in closing, um, avoiding those silos and having the support from, from ministers and from national level um, stakeholders and authorities to help facilitate those connections between the culture sector and other sectors of development is critical to achieving better outcomes for all and a culture goal can help us achieve that. So thank you. Thank you for being here. And I'm going to I'm gonna follow this uh, thread. So why do we need a cultural goal? Well, in fact, we need a cultural goal because we need to ensure that the range of connections uh, between culture and other policy areas are fully accounted for. And this is something that we wrote in the, in the, in the, in the, in the zero draft. Because as I mentioned yesterday, while the SDGs recognizes the interdependence of all human actions, they forget that this interdependence is determined by the diverse cultures that articulate collective action, actions and aspirations. And therefore, this is, it is necessary to go beyond sectorial perspectives and bring culture to the table on post-sectorial and transdisciplinary policy debate. That cultural, the cultural dimension cannot be forgotten in shaping societal, environmental, and economic challenges then that need deep systemic responses to be understood and to be acted upon. Our call is that culture is a fundamental right and has to be considered as the fourth pillar for reaching another paradigm together with the environmental, so social and economical pillars uh, in the SDGs. We aim uh, for a cross-cutting look at all policy areas and a holistic and comprehensive strategy because the complexity of the political agendas needs uh, so need, uh, to reach sustainability needs to be reflected in the political voices around the table. However, we know um, culture is still missing from the main table of policy debates and not having a specific goal does not help. Without the cultural dimension embedded in all ranges of poli pu public policies, there are no possibilities to construct, construct any common space to secure the diversity, to reach equality and social justice, etc. And the cultural rights perspective is the one that should frame this cultural dimension. So the inclusion of, cult of the cultural dimension at the center of the debate of all public policies should be not an option, but a fundamental condition. For this, it is key that we tear down silos for understanding the main, the main cross-cutting issues that can be addressed. More, more meaningful is if only culture is at the table. An approach of this nature needs to solve issues that we have, such as the true mutual recognitions of diverse policies, and therefore of the legitimation of the, di the diverse voices, also from civil society when formulating and implementing policies for sustainability. We claim for a real agency for culture, of culture and of cultural agents in the general policy debates. We need a cultural sector that is engaged in policy planning and implement, implementation, and also an engaged community, which are you, of policymakers to make the case for culture. So help us to bring this cultural goal forward. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much. This is the question. This is Jordi Pasquale speaking, uh, representing the World Organization of Cities, United Cities and Local Governments. The SDGs are a way to describe reality. They describe reality. This is the reality. It's a wrong description. It ignores, it ignores culture. When the description is wrong, the understanding of reality is also wrong. And then the possibility to transform reality is just impossible. This is what's happening with the SDGs right now. Impossible. Uh, we believe the document that we have written is exhaustive, conceptually exhaustive, exhaustive, rigorous. There are 10 indicators, very well written, informed based on a survey and, of course, the involvement of the seven networks of the campaign. Ambitious, why not? And generous, we need more support, we need criticism, we need more voices. We need to ensure adequate focus on culture at the highest level of government, as today's Minister for Culture of Mexico. Thank you. We need you. Hi. Um, I come from Arterial Network. It's a um, Pan-African network. And um, I will speak about the more practical expectations that we have regarding this goal. Um, we believe that having a culture um, goal will help us um, achieve um, growth, legitimacy, and a sense of belonging before our governments and our communities. We saw how fragile our sector is um, when the COVID-19 crisis hit, how fragmented we are. So with a specific goal, um, we hope to be able to look at culture as a common feature um, um, throughout the continent. And, and hence, we, we can conceive a program of culture um, across the continent. For example, um, the mobility question that was mentioned before. Um, we can um, think of our local cultures um, uh, that they need to be taken into account when other sectors are thinking and proposing solutions toward the uh, transformation, be it culture um, for development or culture for peace or culture for environment. Um, in other words, we are saying that if we are to have actions with impact in our continent, we need to never again make the mistake of thinking and bringing solutions from the north to the south. African issues will be solved through African solutions, and this cannot leave culture outside. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have a couple of minutes for our, more for our discussion period. So I will turn to our public and uh, ask you if you have any questions, comments, observations for our respondents or also uh, panelists. Uh, please don't hesitate. Hi, in the, um, in the discussion today, I don't know whether this is the right time to ask this because it might be incongruous because of your appeal, but there is, there is a, a recognition for the need of champions. And uh, it, it's quite a, a, um, a major portion of what you talk about in order to achieve this. So I'm wondering how close are you to thinking you can identify champions and will they be identified with a particular area, rather a, a particular nation or a particular region? Yeah, thanks for the question. It's an extremely important one, and the um, the text of the document goes into less detail than the internal discussions that led to it. Um, it's very clear that processes like the SDG process and any revision to it, any future development of it, will be primarily intergovernmental. Indeed, if you look at uh, the framing of the Rio Plus Plus process, which led to the SDGs, uh, member states looked into it, 
uh, development of the outcome document should be purely intergovernmental. Uh, that wasn't a public document, but I have a very clear memory of those words, purely intergovernmental. Civil society, stay out. So the only way of getting in is to have champions. And champions obviously have to be, first of all, states, let's be very clear, state parties uh, that share the vision. That's the first condition. And probably many would. But secondly, state parties that sharing the vision are prepared to give it a degree of priority. And that's more challenging because states have multiple priorities in their international diplomacy. And this might be something they would support but not be willing to fight for. And the real risk is that everyone will support it and no one will fight for it. And in that case, it will not succeed. So the challenge, as, as I see it, and of course it, it's not for me to speak for the campaign, but I've been spending a lot of time talking to the campaign and I, 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 I understand where people are coming from, um, that do need uh, to be states fighting for this. They need to be diverse. Dream scenario, six to eight states representing all regions of the world uh, willing to work together as a coalition to push. That would be decisive. Does it exist today? No. Could it be built using in particular the uh, circumstances of a meeting like this? Why not? Let's try. I'm speaking way beyond my remit there, but... <laughs> Thank you. I think, uh, Alexandra, you have a question. Uh, yes, I think, please. Thank you. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I have never been to one of these co conferences before, but I work within the CBD and the World Heritage Conventions. I find that the, the thing that's missing out of this is the um, relationship that Indigenous peoples have and the reference or lack of reference to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which Canada mentioned. Um, I think, you know, that's one of the things that's missing as well. And um, I've read the draft statement and I... As I said, I haven't been to one of these before, but I'd like to, you know, sort of see if I can get some support to actually um, make some changes to the to the wording, to include the UN Declaration and to include Indigenous peoples in their cultural values that they have, both intangible and tangible. But it's all within the Declaration in different articles, from rights to education, um, you know, sort of healthy living, um, you know, cultural expressions, right through to economic gain and benefits. So thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, we also noticed that the Canadian Commission for UNESCO that there was lack of representation of Indigenous voices at the table, especially in shaping of cultural policies. And that's why we banded together with Université Laval, Ivana here, and also Kat Turvey, and we quickly put together a document, a short document of about eight pages that's available um, just in the back here about um, important considerations for and also how to, um, the ideas on how to include Indigenous voices in uh, shaping of cultural policy, because it is crucial, and we can't talk about sustainable development and culture without asking and 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 bringing in indigenous voices to 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 inspire and and inform as well thank you very much i think we have here one question thank you so i'm mario santana I'm, uh, secretary general of icomos but i do have a question not as an icomos uh, secretary general because i think that one of the missing in the SDGs. I don't think, you know, state parties are really important, certainly because they are regulators, right? And the regulators, but I think no. they're missing. You know, industry is one of the biggest areas where, you know, like in the built environment, right? The re regeneration, the 
construction of our environment. And I see that we don't have hardly any uh, representative of trade unions and, and other organizations that actually represent industry and how they impact the SDGs. So I'm asking this. Thanks. You're right. This has been one of the failures of the SDG framework. Let's be very clear about that. In 2000, the Millennium Process, which produced the MDGs and the Millennium Declaration, produced, among other things, the Global Compact. The Global Compact was supposed to be uh, an innovative uh, mechanism to allow the private sector to uh, work jointly with states on a kind of quasi-equal level, though, of course, recognizing that ultimately states uh, are sovereign and have regulatory power, but recognizing also that many of the action capacities and technical competences were actually within uh, the business sector. I've never, I haven't seen a formal evaluation of it, but I'm not convinced it's produced very much. So yes, absolutely. Uh, but if you go back, and, and again, failure to achieve doesn't sometimes points to fundamental design flaws. Sometimes it points simply to inadequate uh, implementation. If you go back to the uh, 2030 agenda as declared by the UN General Assembly in September 2015, so not the goals, but the kind of um, preamble to them, which is long, it's 70 articles long, um, it's very clear that the goals are stated to be universal and for everyone. States have specific responsibilities, of course, including legal responsibilities with respect to human rights. Uh, but the goals are not addressed only to states. And it is not a requirement that non-state actors work necessarily through states to achieve in their own remit or on their own terms parts of the SDGs. So, I mean, the business sector has no excuse, really. It could have done much more. It has interestingly adopted the language of the SDGs as a language of reporting and communication, in its worst form, this is greenwashing. In its best form, it's very slow, glacial-paced change of business practices. It's better than nothing. Um, but it's a lot less than it could be, and a lot less than the intention that drove uh, the agenda in the first place. You're right. Thank you. I think we have the time for one more question. Uh, yes, please. Uh, the micro is coming. Thank you. Culture on its own um, needs an acceptance. It needs an acknowledgement because it brings its own intrinsic value with it. And I think one of the things we need to do is to start to really understand how do we accept what we consider. <laughs> not, not what we consider, but what is culture? It is, and it's most of the time, it's not always that we are acknowledging that it exists. So this can be a challenge also. Any comments? Um, need talking about the time. Yes, respondents, please. If and respondents too. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. And that's why I, I know you, I had to read very fast through the targets so you don't have them in your mind, but uh, cultural diversity and a culture of peace were two of the uh, specific components that were built in to our zero draft, precisely for the reasons you mentioned. Um, culture is not just an abstract thing that floats in societies. It's also embodied, as you said earlier, I think, um, in people who are the bearers of culture and uh, the actors through which cultures can be reproduced and transformed. And it's impossible to consider cultures without reference to the people that embody them. So absolutely. And very possibly as the draft evolves, we will need to refine and improve those parts. Very happy, of course, to, to, to work with you on specific ideas you might have to speak better to what needs to be achieved for this to be taken on board. Because the point isn't to produce an academic report. The point is to produce leverage for action. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crowley. Uh, thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you to our respondents. Thank you to our panelists, to our public for these fruitful and dynamic exchanges. Uh, that have allowed us to understand, to better understand uh, the mm. contemporary and new challenges and issues facing all actors concerned and involved in the development of cultural policies. Now I have uh, the great pleasure to invite uh, Alexandra Xantaki, the Special Rapporteur of the United Nations in the field of cultural rights, to give us some final uh, words. Thank you. Hello. Um, I have to say that I have been really impressed with um, UNESCO Canada uh, and the toolkit. So thank you very much, Paolo and Barbara and your colleagues who have done such an excellent job. Um, when it comes to culture and cultural rights, sometimes we continue to be too generic and we continue to be too vague and um, uh, we need more um, uh, specific um, uh, projects such as this one coming from um, from from uh, uh, various state commissions of UNESCO. Um, I'm also very impressed about the of um, regarding the focus of this toolkit. Um, cultural sector is full of creative people, creative thinkers, and they are going to help us understand more about the real meaning, the varied meanings of development. Um, and they're going to help us disseminate marginalized knowledge to new audiences. Um, this is what I say in my report to the UN General Assembly that um, has been published, and I'm going to talk about, um, about it in the General Assembly on the 20th of October. Um, so it is, it is very impressive to see how from um, specific priorities we go down to um, real, um, uh, real projects that advocate for um, uh, cultural rights in development. And I have to say that I do have a soft spot uh, about Indigenous peoples, and I think that uh, an Indigenous people's rights, especially when it comes to culture, and in specific their contribution um, to us understanding, uh, to the whole humanity, understanding what really we mean by culture. Before the very powerful transnational Indigenous movement um, appearing before the United Nations, uh, taking us all aback by their energy and by their um, rightful insistence um, to, to um, have their rights recognized, we all thought that culture was uh, mainly uh, capital, uh, mainly uh, we talked about it in economic considerations. But now, um, and, and very much because of um, them, we know that culture is very much a way of life. So I am particularly um, um, happy, uh, especially as somebody who has been following the um, elaboration of the then draft declaration um, of the rights of Indigenous peoples to, to see this being taken into account by Canada, and especially by Canada, because as you know, Canada was one of the states that at the beginning was a bit reluctant. So now becoming an advocate um, to, to cultural rights of indigenous people seen as flowing down from self-determination um, is fantastic. Um, uh, and, and reconciliation uh, using uh, cultural rights is, is uh, brilliant. Using the cultural sector and uh, enterprises, et cetera, and other actors is very important. And I am also quite, I was very happy to listen to the uh, indigenous woman who uh, spoke. And I'm looking forward to meeting more uh, members of minorities in Mondiakult and members of uh, migrants, um, members of um, marginalized um, groups. I'm sure they're here. I just tend to see, um, you know, uh, state representatives more and um, um, uh, academics and, and experts. Um, so I am um, I'm looking forward to seeing them and, and um, uh, making sure that they tell us how they think that um, development should um, include cultural rights. 
Um, it is regrettable that the SDGs do not include culture and cultural rights. And I know that this is what they will say. And I know that what they will also say is that um, what Jordi said uh, earlier today, um, civil society have done their work. They have come up with the methodologies. They have come up with the gaps. They have come up with the ways forward. It is up to the states now to help us implement um, the uh, legal obligations they have undertaken regarding culture and cultural rights through UNESCO and through human rights, the human rights framework. And I am looking forward to listening more about um, fantastic ways and innovative ways that Culture. That's fine. Having um, having a specific goal uh, on culture is certainly, together with mainstreaming culture more in the other goals, is certainly a way forward. Um, and I'm looking forward to identifying the specific states that will help the civil society uh, realize this goal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for your closing remarks. On behalf of the organizers of this side event, the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign and the Canadian Commission for UNESCO, I would like to thank our panelists, our respondents, our public for participating and being part of this event. I would like especially to thank uh, the UNESCO and the government of Mexico uh, for including us uh, uh, in this uh, Mondia Cult 2022 conference. Thank you very much.